You are king. You are sovereign. You are in charge. You hold the oceans in your hand. You hold the universe in your hand. You hold us in your hands. We thank you for your good, kingly care of all things. We thank you that you are writing history according to your script. We trust you. We love you. We ask even as we look at your word this morning that you would be king in our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is a time in our service where we remember the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and we proclaim it to one another until he comes. We do that via some symbols, a piece of bread and a cup of juice. Uh, This is the Lord's table or communion. The bread represents Jesus' body and the juice represents his blood. Both emblems represent Jesus' death in the place of sinners. To get us thinking about that just a little bit this morning, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 5. If you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to have one. There are some men that are going to proceed down the aisles with Bibles in their hands. These are for you. Just slip your hand up. Let them know that you need one this morning. If you don't own a Bible, this is yours to keep. Uh, We are glad for you to have a copy of God's Word in your own hands. In Psalm 5, we see the absolute standard of perfection that is required to be in God's presence. And then we're going to see someone who broke that standard and went into God's presence. Psalm 5, verse 4. Follow along with me as I read this. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil does not sojourn with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. Yahweh abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. There's the standard. Evil doesn't go in God's house. God hates the sin and the sinner. Men of bloodshed and deceit are abhorred by Yahweh. Now, if you're here this morning and you say you have no sin, the Bible would protest your own heart and your conscience protest and the people that live with you protest. This presents the great problem of the Bible. If God hates sin and those who do sin and he doesn't allow any evil in his house, what hope is there? Now we look to the author of this song. His name is David. He was a king over Israel and a songwriter And he tells us that in verse 7, he enters God's house. Notice this. He says, but as for me, I will enter your house. Now, what about David? We just read that God abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Can you think of any people characterized by bloodshed and deceit, the evil tyrants of the world? Maybe characters in the Bible, and maybe the writer of this song. In fact, David's bloodshed, the murder of Uriah, was a cover-up, a deceitful cover-up for his adultery with Uriah's wife. David was a man guilty of bloodshed and deceit, so guilty, in fact, so notorious, that when Jesus the Messiah is introduced in a genealogy in the book of Matthew, it begins, Jesus the son of David. And when it gets to the part, the begat, the begat, the begat, whose dad was who, and it gets to the part about David, David is described by the name Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah. What ends up in the genealogy depicting the the great king of Israel, the hero of the Old Testament, the man over God's own heart, He's described as a man of bloodshed and deceit with the names of his victims in the genealogy. How does David enter the house of Yahweh when the standard is perfection? It's right here in verse 7. I hope you see this. But as for me, David says, in the abundance of your loving kindness... 
Literally, he says, by your great grace, I enter your house. David doesn't get into the house of Yahweh by his achievements, by cleaning himself up, by getting religious, by outdoing his bad deeds with enough good deeds. You could never do that. Even the attempt to do that is a bad deed. No, David gets in and he only gets in by God's great grace. This leads us to David's great, 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 great grandson, the Messiah, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was fully God, but who took on human flesh to dwell among us, to live out a sinless life. No one else has done that. So that he would be qualified to die as the innocent substitute in the place of sinners. Jesus went to a cross and he died. He died on purpose, his purpose, to rescue sinners by his vicarious death. That means he died in my place. He died in your place if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. His death was the payment for bloodshed and deceit for all who would believe. And listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has paid for your sins at the cross so that in God's accounting, there is no more bloodshed. There is no more deceit on your account. It is a perfect payment for the debt that you owed. That's what we're here to celebrate this morning. That's what we're here to proclaim until Jesus returns week after week through these symbols Jesus, you died for me. You paid for my sins. It's my only hope. Only by your great grace do I get in. There's a perfect absolute standard of holiness none of us meets. But there is a wide open invitation for any who would believe this very day to possess eternal life, a clean account, and a right standing with God. If you're here this morning... You don't have to be a member of Grace Bible Church to partake in the Lord's table. We're we're glad that you're here. Uh, Take these elements, eat and drink as a reminder that Jesus died a sacrificial substitutionary death in your place. Rejoice in forgiveness. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this isn't for you. You're sort of an audience watching what believers in Christ are doing, taking these symbols. The Bible's clear. Don't take these in in an inappropriate manner. You heap judgment upon yourself. But if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're watching believers take these symbols and, and proclaim Jesus' death as our Savior, paying for our sins. Consider your own heart. Consider your own standing before the Lord. And believe. Surrender to Christ. Believe that his death in your place fully satisfies God's holy wrath against your sin and you will have eternal life. There will be a moment of silence after the symbols are distributed. That silence is designed for you to examine your own heart. Believer, your task, according to 1 Corinthians 11, is to examine your heart, to see what is there. Is there unconfessed sin you need to take before the Lord? Are there unreconciled relationships you need to make plans to reconcile? Uh, If anything is outstanding with you, take that before the Lord, confess it, and then rejoice in the forgiveness Jesus purchased and partake with us. If you're not a believer, it's a great opportunity, a, a moment of silence for you before the Lord to think about who he is and who you are and how only Jesus Christ bridges the gap. The men are going to come forward at this time and they will distribute those symbols to you. Uh, This morning, you will take this on your own after some moments of contemplation. So go to the Lord in prayer, examine your own heart, rejoice in the gospel, or maybe for the first time today, believe the gospel. And then when your heart is prepared, you take these elements. I will close us in prayer.